Fantastic. Thank you uh, very much, everyone. Great to see so many people here. It's funny how the room thing, we had like a dozen people in the big room up there before, and this thing was packed, but yeah. Anyway, what's electronic signage for? Um, okay, so um, this is going to be uh, an interesting sort of thing because obviously I based um, this um, session on a uh, song, which is 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover by Paul Simon. And I only realized the other day when I was typing in the year into iTunes and stuff that it's actually a 1975 song and everything. So who's Paul Simon? <laughs> uh, hands up, who's heard of Paul Simon? Oh, there we go. Fantastic. OK, that's good. Um, OK, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to the song. I was playing through the video before just so it's refreshed in your memory. Um, I'm Managing Director Glow Digital. Uh, there's my contact info. Um, this is our um, new branding, our new website that went up last night and everything. We've got a guy talking about responsive design, so we figured, gee, we better have a responsive site by the time DrupalCon comes around, so check it out sometime. Uh, we're also sponsoring coffee, uh -huh. and you must, this is my little, my little uh, sp spiel, uh, you must enter our competition to win an iPad mini as well. So to do that, you have to uh, look in your program guide and do the appropriate folding to make that response, to make our little program ad responsive. You'll get the gist of it. Um, and there's a QR code on the cups that you have to take a picky of to enter. OK, I like music, tennis, and photography, and that is a rock in my backyard. There you go. <laughs> Why not? Um, OK, so 10 ways to cost Drupal projects. Now, there are uh, a million ways to cost them. And really, it's not so much about the costing. It's about the situations that you encounter uh, that you have to interpret and then work out, well, how the heck am I going to approach this? So really, it's kind of more like 10 situations um, that you need to come up with the costing in with various different conditions. So that's really um, what my 10 lines of the song cover. So we'll get to the song in a minute. Um, the 10 ways uh, are listed thus, uh, and I'm going to go into these in some uh, detail. You can just read that for yourself. Um, I've got a fair bit of material to go through. I'm not quite sure how long it'll take, so I might speed up or slow down. And um, any questions probably will wait to the end, and we'll leave, try to leave a fair bit of time at the end for some, some questions and discussion. And I'm interested in, in input from you as well, because I'm sure uh, okay, we have to do the mandatory hands up thing. Okay, so hands up who runs uh, a Drupal agency and develops websites for people. Great, thank you very much. There's quite a few. H hands up who develops websites internally for their own company. Excellent, fantastic. So it's about sort of a, almost a 50-50 there, which is fantastic. Um, um, okay, so the 10 ways. What's well, not covered? Lots and stuff. So um, yeah, by all means, um, we'll have a bit of a discussion later. Um, okay, here he is in the 70s, <laughs> scary stuff, um, complete with the appropriate um, uh, mo. Uh, this is a more recent shot of uh, Paul Simon. And I was playing the music before, but look, I'll play a little bit now and I have to rewind here. Always dangerous playing video from within PowerPoint, isn't it? And I'm going to move it along. The problem is all inside your head, she said to me. The answer is easy if you take it logically. I'd like to help you in your struggle to be free. There must be 50 ways to leave your lover. Just read that as 50 ways to cut up. She said, it's really not my habit to intrude. Furthermore, I hope my meaning won't be lost or misconstrued. So I repeat myself, at the risk of being crude, there must be 50 ways to leave your lover. That's one of the chorus. 50 ways to leave your lover. You just flip out the back tent. Say you make a new plan, stand. You don't need to be caught right. Just listen to me. So you hop on the bus, bus. Don't need to discuss much. Just drive off the key and get yourself free. Ooh, slip out the back, yeah. Just make a new plan, stand. Don't need to be caught. 
Okay, so that'll do for now. Okay, we're going to hear snippets of that again in a minute. So on with the ten ways. Um, okay, so what I've got here is um, for each of the ten ways to cost a project, I've got a little uh, line of the song. So uh, let's see if this actually works. Again, very brave doing PowerPoint from... Make a new plan, Stan. Okay, make a new plan, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, that's the short name. The long name for uh, way number one is entire project from conception using a methodology with a paid discovery phase. Okay, a few problems are already. What are those terms? And I want to spend a bit of time on some of these terms because it's critical to how we're going to approach this thing. Um, okay, so a project from conception means that you start at the beginning um, where the client, in theory, has an idea of what they want to achieve and they probably have lots of, lots of suggestions about how to achieve things. Um, and I'm sure you'll agree that projects from conception are projects that everyone loves. You know, um, okay, who are developers here, please? Yeah, lots of developers and every, everything. Um, is there any type of project that you love more than a new project from conception? Any hands? <laughs> oh, really? Support. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, there you go. Very important support. Uh, but most people like new stuff, green fields. Um, uh, but also, uh, company owners like projects from conception uh, because uh, they tend to be a bit larger, I guess, um, has the whole, gets the whole team involved. Um, uh, and project managers like them because, again, uh, they get to work with Greenfield. Um, developers love them because, <coughs> yeah, the world's their oyster. Um, and really, everyone likes the idea of conception, I think. Um, okay, but... A uh, few projects really are from conception, really. Um, uh, it's very rare that you'll find a, pro a client comes to you and says, um, I've got this wad of money I want to give to you. Can you please create a plan for me with using your best practice and just make it happen? Why not? Why <laughs> <laughs> um, well, at least in my experience, that's kind of rare. Usually they come up with, uh, you know, you go, yeah, okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> Um, so, in reality, really, um, they come to you with, with a list of things that they need. They come to you with solutions uh, for their problems and everything. So, they say, right, I need a blog, um, I need a, an event management system or something like that. And you really have to say, whoa there, Bessie, um, stop and we'll find out actually what your business problems are in order to be able to solve those. So, you've really got to find out. Um, you've really got to get past what they think the project is about uh, and, and really reassess that yourself. Um, they might come to you with some design ideas. Uh, okay, one, one more show of hands here and I promise not to, I'll, to try not to do any more after this. Who has had a client who has strong opinions about the design? Okay, everyone. <laughs> that's, got to be, that's very impressive. Um, and often, uh, designers will tell you, user experience will te uh, experts will tell you that uh, really they have to go back to the start as well and ask the client, well, really, what are your goals? What are we trying to achieve? Um, so really, oh, and the functionality needed as well. The client, you know, has a list of things that they want you to implement, of course, and they, and they really need to unlearn all of those things. Um, using methodology. Uh, so, methodology is a guideline system for solving a problem with specific components such as phases, tasks, methods, techniques and tools. Um, the reason I'm going to this level on a methodology is because it's really, really critical that you understand that you have a methodology and that you understand it uh, well enough to be able to quote your projects well because the quote depends very much on your methodology in the case of Greenfield's projects. Um, typical steps in a methodology, sort of these days, it's hard to find information on methodologies uh, because people think that they're secrets and um, don't want to give it to the competition and what have you. So really, if you look it up on the web, it's kind of hard to find. But these are some typical steps. Um, discovery phase, content strategy stuff, um, design, construction, launch, post-launch. So those things are about, design is typically sort of, you know, your project brief, um, work out your goals, you might have some uh, stakeholder interviews, do some user research, user types, goals, personas, scenarios, potentially. 
Um, and reviews as well. So review the existing site, review the uh, marketing strategy, review the branding, review the competition. Um, discovery phase, the reason I wanted to go into such detail on that is because it is critical for Greenfield projects. Uh, your content strategy, um, typically that'll be you know, your information architecture, uh, i.e. site map and other stuff. Uh, wireframe diagrams, um, maybe responsive layouts, um, breakpoints, etc. Implementation strategy, which is how you put things together in Drupal. Um, design will typically be user experience stuff, uh, maybe Photoshop layouts if you still use that. Um, style tiles, it's a really interesting concept. Um, I don't know if um, anyone here from phase two. It's a person, f if you go to um, styletill.es, which spells style tiles, um, it's a fascinating concept um, for. Uh, preventing you from needing to come up with an entire website design in Photoshop. You can just really come out with a sort of um, uh, the design elements. A little bit like if you go shopping, you know, in a, uh, a, a bathroom sales store or something. You basically grab a tile, you put it next to some material, next to some carpet and stuff. It's a top concept. Developed by someone whose name I forget who used to work for Phase 2 technology. Um, Okay, so design, uh, construction will be building the site. Okay, that's what uh, most uh, um, uh, people here actually know something about. Um, launching it, setting up database, server, CDN potentially, um, deployment, um, documentation, training, go live, etc. Uh, and post-launch stuff, which is a, a gamut, a variety of things, uh, including uh, yeah, promotional activities, um, a support and maintenance contract or SLA. Um, a review of both the project process and the, um, the outcomes, measure the outcomes, metrics, um, and potentially continued edu education as well. So they are typical steps, but there, it, um, and as I said before, you, it's pretty hard to actually find examples from the internet, but here's one. I don't know this company, um, Creative Stride. Anyone heard of them? They're in the States somewhere? Yeah, you have? Right, oh, you've heard of everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this, this was good, I thought, because this did have those elements. I don't know if you can sort of read that properly, but it has a lot of that stuff that I was just sort of talking about in a slight, you know, slightly different word, um, but very important um, uh, elements, all of those. By the way, the slides for this session and uh, all sessions are going to be made available on the website uh, all in one batch together, um, presumably sometime tomorrow. Uh, here's another one, Envision Interactive. I don't know these companies, but um, these are the only couple that I could really find that actually listed a bit about their methodology. Uh, and one more as well. So methodology, you know, what I've talked about so far in terms of methodology has been sort of a pretty comprehensive sort of thing. Here's one that is a little bit on the other end of the scale from Nick's site. Step one, ask yourself, what am I really trying to achieve? Step two, step three, step four, that's it. <laughs> Cute. So really... A methodology is whatever you decide is going to be your working practice to get things done. And that is up to you. That's not the topic of this talk. The topic of this talk is how to cost, how to put a price on what you're going to be asking for. Um, and I'm still explaining the term, <laughs> the, the, the meaning behind uh, make, make a new plan stand uh, with a paid discovery phase. So before we talked about the discovery phase having various components. And the, the, the idea is that it uncovers enough information to plan and cost the project properly. Um, and of course, the actual steps uh, in the discovery phase are probably going to include some of the things I mentioned before, but it will depend on how you go about doing your projects. Um, and some people call it other things, uh, a study, um, a project evaluation, uh, and a scoping are the terms that I've heard before, a scoping exercise. Um, okay, can we just have that one? Uh, right, so um, the big advantage with, um, uh, I guess, having a Greenfields project with uh, a paid discovery phase uh, is that it gives you a huge opportunity to actually discover what the project is about without making a significant expenditure. Um, 
You'll see in a minute um, the second uh, way to quote projects is very similar to the first way, but there's no paid discovery phase. In other words, the client comes to you and says, hey, we want a site, give us a full proposal. And you really have to kind of make guesses. We'll get to that in a minute. So the advantage is that we know what the project's about and then really we cost it in two phases. The first phase being we, uh, we charge or quote the client for the discovery phase only. Um, once they're happy with that, we understand what the project is about. It's much easier to quote the rest of the project, of course. I mean, it's just common, common sense, really. Um, okay, so will the client pay for a discovery phase? And you know, I've lost a slide here. I was editing these the other day. There's one more thing I wanted to say, um, and I'll find the reference later. Um, one of the names for the discovery phase was a project evaluation, and I'll post this link, I'll fix the slides and post it, um, uh, post an updated version. There's a great um, story, oh, maybe it's actually coming up there. Yeah, I see it's coming up. There it is. This is a great article, it's just fantastic. Um, and it's about uh, project proposals. Um, so, uh, just forgive me, I'll just read this. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. This is posted on, um, on Smashing Magazine. After several gruelling days, I'd finally finished the proposal. Tell me if you relate to this. Uh, I sent it off and waited for a response. Nothing. After a few weeks, I discovered that they were just looking, in inverted commas. Despite the urgency and aggressive timeline for the RFP, plus the fact that we had done business with this organisation before, the project was a no-go. My, my days of effort were, were entirely wa were wasted. Not entirely, though, because the pain of that loss was enough to drive me to decide that it wouldn't happen again. Holy moly, who's been there? <laughs> yeah, okay, lots of hands. Um, this is a great article. I really encourage you to read that. Um, and uh, there it is, actually. Stop writing project proposals. And my subtitle is Start Writing Evaluation. So they call that discovery phase a project evaluation and they charge the client for it. Marvellous idea. Um, will they pay for it? That's the question. Uh, my comments are, if they're serious about the project, they'll pay for it. If they really want you know, someone who, uh, <laughs> if they want a half-baked solution, they should simply ask for you know, an entire project from conception. Um, Vesa Palmo uh, was here just before, uh, popped his head in and stuff. He was talking about um, agile, processes, uh, and that was really, really interesting. He was saying uh, that um, agile processes are really great, especially for large projects. For smaller projects, you can kind of plan the whole thing through and things tend not to go wrong, or if they do go wrong, they don't have such an impact. Large projects, something goes wrong, they have big impacts. Um, so wouldn't your client really, don't they need a head read if they don't actually um, take the project seriously and do an initial study before going any further. And the other thing is, do you really want them if they don't pay for it? Hmm. Okay, so options for costing the discovery phase. Um, uh, there's lots of ways to do this. You can have a standard cost in theory. So uh, you could just say, right, uh, my typical website size is such and such, and you can say, right, two grand, two grand a pop or something if most of your projects are similar. Um, you could say um, uh, variable costs sort of based on your feel for the project size. Now this word feel, I wanted to put in inverted commas because that's surprisingly important uh, in, in these matters and we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, maybe a percentage of the estimated project size. Um, chicken and the egg there, how do you work out how big your project is before you kind of find out about it? Um, feel has something to do with that, you know, just chatting to the client. Um, and potentially you could go all the way and actually do a detailed costing for your discovery phase. So there's lots of options there. Often, you know, in the first couple of minutes of talking to a client, you will get a feel for how big a project is. And you can sort of say, you could actually uh, present a price with, with um, conditions saying, you know, for a typical project that is going to take, you know, 120 hours or something to, to work on, you know, we charge this much. If it turns out to be more than this, we'll charge this much more for the extra. Hmm. Pretty easy. Now, I wanted to talk about feel. Um, feel uh, is important in these ways. Um, to work out the overall project size, as I said. Um, to work out what the client is going to be likely to deal with. 
um, three to work out what they're likely to pay. Um, and that's all, I think. <laughs> um, also, when you look at the Smashing Magazine article, check out comment 147 as well. It's really pertinent. And in fact, I'm going to read this one as well. I don't have it up here, but um, it, it goes like, um, it says this. Um, uh, I've been in this industry 17 years and have had similar issues. We now don't bother with RFPs, and now I'm very bold when someone needs three to five quotes. I ask in advance if they are getting competitive bids. Uh, I ask if I get to address the decision makers. I explain this is a relationship, not a one-time service, and let them know it can take one to two days to engineer a <coughs> quote. I ask point blank if they are serious about doing business with me. If it feels right, heal. Um, and without question, my intuition is usually correct. Hopefully that comes after experience. I decide to create the proposal or to turn it down. So this feel thing is really important because for this guy, the feel of uh, whether a client you know, sounds right uh, for, for, for him, um, the decision depends on a feel. Wow, okay. Um, also, I saw an interview of Mark Bolton on Vogue World and for the life of me, I really can't find it. Uh, now, it was a podcast, um, and he was saying that his relationship, Mark Bolden, by the way, is the guy who um, helped redesign Drupal homepage um, for Drupal 7, was it? 7? Yeah. Current, current version? Anyone heard of Mark Bolton? I think he designed the, he redesigned the logo and everything. Yeah, tough job with a bunch of developers. <laughs> um, and his opinion was, yeah, the rela his relationship with the client, it has to feel right and everything. And if it doesn't, he actually knocks them back, which is kind of hard if you need the money, but often you're, uh, you're better off actually not entering into a bad relationship in the first place if you know it's not going to be good. Um, I'll give you another example as well of feel, um, just because I think feel is so important. Um, one of our, we have a client in, we're in Brisbane, one of our client's staff changed, so the person we dealt with on this system that we had developed in 2008 uh, changed, um, and we dealt with a new person for enhancements uh, and support. Um, and interestingly enough, when the site needed some particular enhancements, um, <laughs> the, our new client didn't want to tell us what their budget was, instead they hinted that they were considering sort of outsourcing to China. <laughs> which um, gave me a very bad feel because uh, we pride ourselves on high quality development um, and you know, good quality processes. Um, we have uh, permanent staff you know, in the office during office hours that they can talk to uh, and we can go around and see the client and everything. Um, so really that started to feel like a bad match with the client uh, and the jury is still out about what will happen there. <laughs> so my point, feel is important. Um, okay, now one thing I didn't test before I came on board here was whether my little... Yes. Do you uh, test feel only after you've been burned? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think that goes to experience, to be honest. Um, it's absolutely, you know, and, and the, the feel that you get really, once, once you get burned, yeah, you really, you really get a, a, a feel for that situation again and you don't make the same mistake twice. Um, Okay, so yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. And feel, feel free to chime in, I reckon. That'll make it more interactive. Yo. Um, how do you, what uh, techniques, uh, when you talk to a client about starting this out, yep. how do you sell it to them to get benefits? How do you sell it to them? Um, yeah, I, I think you really need to actually list out all of the benefits for, for, your own, for your own mind and everything with respect to your methodology. So I would actually make sure that A, I know my methodology and everything, and B, I know what the advantages are. You know? And you can also um, uh, come to a couple of sessions tomorrow. Um, there's a session by um, uh, Philippe Rubim and another one by David Kalkali about dealing with government and dealing with corporate clients and stuff that actually talks a little bit about that. So I would actually, yeah, work that out um, and make sure you've got a cheat sheet so when you talk to them you can actually I know that's not really answering your question, but it really does depend on, on how it works. Um, okay. Now, the one thing I didn't test here was um, my Google Doc, which is not working. Oh, 
Oh, that, that's, a, that's an image. I really wanted to kind of uh, go through it. So basically, if we put it over here. Oh, there it is. Fantastic. Um, okay. So, if I just swap back to my slide. Hmm. Uh, right. Now, you can follow along if you wish. If you've got a laptop there, you can actually go in and have a look at this, or you can do it later. It's a Google spreadsheet, so it's multi-user access. Um, and I've made this uh, publicly uh, accessible. But I actually wanted to go through a bit of an example uh, of uh, what you can actually do to come up with a, um, a costing for uh, the discovery phase. So, so it's, I guess it's sort of related to, to your question as well. Um, first of all, at the top, Oh yeah, and if you could, um, when you go into it, <laughs> you'll get a little purple or different colour and everything. So if you cannot move around too much, it won't distract from where I'm pointing. <laughs> um, okay, so you got your rate card there. You got your different, um, your different uh, people, and you feel free to actually copy this as well from from where it is. You've got your different uh, roles. You may not have as many, or or you may have more roles. You can change the rates, etc. Um, you have to decide on a contingency figure there um, and a project management overhead. Um, and then you work out basically what your steps in your methodology in your discovery phase are. So you might have a project brief, you know, which uses a project manager resource at 100 bucks an hour. They'll take two hours. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, with a cost of $200. So the same thing uh, for the other roles, you know, for these different steps. Uh, fill in your own methodology. Um, you need to add some sort of contingency offer, obviously. So, you know, I've chosen 10% there as a round number, but you could be 50% on a small thing like this, maybe. Um, and add a project management fee. I always recommend to add those two items, you know, both a contingency figure and a project management fee. Because project management fee, the idea behind these here is you're putting in the hours that the, the actual work is going to take. So if there was a development phase here, and we'll get to that, the, the hours that the developer has estimated, probably multiplied by 1.5 or 2, if <laughs> if it's like um, uh, other developers I know. Um, okay, so we have those, and uh, out pops at the bottom a uh, total. So we're also separating it into optional components. So here in this methodology, we've got uh, eight hours optionally um, of advanced user research, which might be. Uh, some user testing, or it might be uh, user personas and scenarios, for example. Um, and often the client may or may not want to want to want to um, participate in that particular option. It's always. I also read another interesting article that uh, talks about how it's great to give clients options. Okay, you give them like a vanilla version, you give them sort of a medium version, and you give them a say a, a, a super duper version, and they can pick their options. And for some reason, it just makes the client feel better because if they're a budget-conscious person, they'll probably go for the for the low one. If there's someone who you know just wants the bees knees, they'll probably go for the high one. And if there's someone who is you know, like quality but don't want to pay too much for it, they'll probably go for the middle one. Okay, uh, there it is. Great. Okay, so that's just a, a screen print of that, and you can go have a look at it. Um, once the discovery phase is complete, then let's say, assume they actually said, yes, we will pay for that, um, and everyone was ha happy, the advantage is that uh, quoting the rest of the project becomes easy because you know all about what's going to be involved in that project. Um, and you've got the history with the client, so they have an immediate trust in you, and to be honest, you have the inside running on the competition should they actually decide that they want to go out to tender or RFP, they'll invite you for sure, if you did a good job, <laughs> uh, and they'll invite maybe one or two other organisations, but you've got the inside running because you know them and they have their trust in you. So, um, okay, what if your method? I said your methodology could be anything. What if it's agile? Um, and um, uh, was there any? Did anyone attend uh, Vesa Palmo's um, talk before? Yeah, great. Um, it was interesting that um, I was speaking to him afterwards as well, and I said, you know, how, how sorted? do you really have the, the costing of the Agile process? And he said, about 50%. <laughs> so I'm glad that you know, someone who touts um, a lot of experience with Agile methodology really hasn't got, the, got the, um, the quoting quite worked out yet. And there I saw a tweet from him some time ago 
that he's thinking about it, which is great. I also saw a tweet today from uh, Justin Freeman. Are you here? No, he's not here. Um, Agile Wear in Canberra, the Drupal shop down there. Um, and he suggested maybe you charge by the sprint. Okay, so if you have a weak sprint or something with you know three developers or something like that, uh, potentially charge by the sprint. Um, it sounds like a pretty good idea. We haven't done that before, but I'd be interested in hearing anyone who has worked that out. Of course, you'd have to actually sell the process to the client first, sell them, and uh, Vesa talked about that. Sina. So for the audio um, recording, <laughs> um, you come up here and talk into my neck. <laughs> Please. Uh, uh, what did you say again? You made me distracted me. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, for, for projects that are gen generally cost a bit more. Yeah, look, I, I'm showing you figures here and everything, and look, they're very, they're totally made up sort of figures. You know, I don't know, I don't know what you charge as an hourly rate. In Sydney, it's bound to be more, higher cost of living. Um, it'll depend on how big an agency you are as well. Yeah, so sub your own figures in. Um, okay, um, and um, yeah, I, I like the idea of charging by the sprint. It sounds very consistent with, with that. Okay, so um, just as a, uh, um, as a bit of a summary then, I don't know what that slide's doing there. As a summary, I reckon this number one, make a new plan stand, um, yeah, is a pretty good option. And this is by far my favorite way to work because it's a greenfield thing, everyone likes the project, you can use your most recent methodology um, and uh, you know what the, what the project's about. The risk is very low for you and the client, to be honest, to be fair. Okay, number two, I've cheated with the first two because I'm using the same line from the song um, because they're, they're so similar. Um, and that's not working. Hmm. I was considering that. <laughs> Would you believe, but no. Um, so this is similar, entire project from conception, that's the same, using methodology, that's the same with no paid discovery, fo uh, with no paid discovery phase. So in other words, they want an upfront quote. I should clarify here as well, these first two, I'm actually talking really about uh, a process where the client sort of comes to you with some sort of brief, or maybe an RFQ, a request for quotation, or maybe an RFP, a request for proposal. So they're that sort of thing. So I'm going to talk about tenders um, in a minute. Okay, so without a paid discovery phase, what time did we start, by the way? Did we start at quarter two? Holy moly, better get going. Um, okay, we have much less information, or as we know, errant information, because we haven't had the, the opportunity to, to, to talk to the client about what the project is about. Um, there's no guarantee of getting paid for, for the work, so basically you need to factor that into your charges. You have to make a bunch of assumptions. Um, because you're making guesstimates, you probably have to increase that 10% contingency figure, which, which will increase the bottom line cost for the client. And the client, oh gee, everyone's had this. You know, if they come to you with a wimpy request for a website and everything, uh, and if they go to 10 agencies, they'll get, you know, 12 answers uh, about, and how are they going to compare those proposals? Uh, because they'll be for totally different systems because they haven't specified it. Um, Okay, so you'll have to decide whether you want to be part of that, really. Um, and the risk is that you'll spend significant time and you won't get paid for that time. Um, the self-fulfilling prophecy part is, okay, if I'm not going to get paid for the time, I'm not going to put the time in, therefore I won't win the bid. <laughs> so it, it's a tricky thing. Um, some projects are probably worth it. Um, and my recommendation would simply to be um, follow your gut feel, not your heart. Now, the reason I say that uh, very briefly is because oh, there's a project just at the end of last year that I followed my heart. It was a great cause and everything. It didn't quite stack up in the start, but you know, I was talking to the CEO, I wasn't talking to the actual board, which were the stakeholders, but it was such a great cause, I thought, oh, I'll just you know, put in for this and I'll show them. I won't respond uh, to what they ask for, I'll tell them what they really need. Bad move. <laughs> 
Yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so an example of a costing without a discovery phase. Uh, we'll move to the next uh, sheet. Uh, where is it? There. Okay, the entire project. It's a very similar sort of spreadsheet uh, to the last one. We've, still, we've got a discovery phase, but we've got to include a whole bunch of other things now. So we'll include all our methodology, and we've got to make some sort of guesses there. Notice how, how broad this is here when I, when I um, work out, well, how much are we going to sort of spend on actually building the site? Um, you've got to kind of have broad guesses here. Uh, and, but down the bottom, you still come out with some totals. Okay, so that's one way to actually do it. Yeah, feel free to look at that later. Um, okay, so the verdict um, on the no paid discovery phase at the beginning is try to get paid for discovery phase, in my opinion. Yeah, it just makes it so much harder, but you can't always. Um, okay, number three. Let's see if we can get this little clip going. Beautiful. Hop on the bus, Gus. Okay, so hop on the bus, Gus. That means the whole project is in motion and you have to run alongside and jump, jump in. Um, meaning that you're asked to develop a site based on designs, existing designs, uh, or wireframes, or prototype, or maybe someone's actually commenced the build and you have to come in and help them, or take over, or something like that. Much of the planning is actually done, you don't get a choice in that. Whole bunch of caveats come in here. Notice how, with this costing thing, I'm actually not talking that much about costing and figures, I'm talking about situations, really here, that you have to watch out for and different approaches to them. So you've got to watch for all of these things. Um, design, missing page designs, vector design files, holy moly. Um, print designers do not understand um, uh, pr vector and raster. Um, it doesn't matter how you drum it into them, so you just say, right, we want Photoshop files, we won't negotiate on in design. Um, you, de you designers and developers out there will understand that one. Um, or they'll give you wireframes. Uh, we did an interesting project recently. Um, uh, a design agency got a big government job in Queensland and they didn't have any capability to actually fulfill it, so they got us to do it. Um, but they mocked up the wireframes in Axia. I think that's how you pronounce it. Axia? Anyone, anyone use that? Axia? Um, it's a pretty expensive um, a tool, but it's actually pretty jolly good. And it gives you interactive wireframes that actually work. You can do links in it and menus and all sorts of stuff. It's pretty interesting. Um, but therein lied a bit of a caveat, lay a bit of a caveat, caveat because um, uh, with, a, with a working prototype like that that they control, that's actually the specification, how do you lock that down? Um, so what I did was actually got them to uh, produce a PDF from it, which did not have the interactivity, and a few little, we, we ended up with a few little gotchas functionality we didn't realize was there. Um, so, and all this really goes to, um, being able to define um, what, you, what you're agreeing to fairly carefully. Um, in terms of mess, look, there's all sorts of things that can happen on a project that's started already, and you have to make this assessment before you go into it, I think. Um, th things like they haven't scoped the project well enough, so what is being built and what you're asked to build is actually not what the client wants and will make them happy, so therefore it's going to be a lose situation. <laughs> You probably don't want to be involved in that, or you try to be proactive and actually redirect the project, get it back on track. Um, and that particularly happens if the, pro if the um, goals of the project have not been defined. Um, the, you, the relationship with the client is, is often messy, um, and of course the old, um, the old beauty, insufficient budget. If they don't really have the money and they want you to bring you on board, uh, do you really want to be part of it if they don't have enough money to pay to do it properly? Hmm. Um, okay, so what do you do? Um, you have to decide. Um, you could do a detailed costing. Um, you could, uh, I suggest, always uh, lock down the scope. That's probably the most important thing. Work out who's responsible for what, particularly when there's multiple organizations involved, and define the conditions in a contract. Very important. Um, I'm going to skip through this. The most important thing that's in the contract has got to be really the specification. Uh, if you don't have that uh, careful enough, um, y you're just asking for trouble and you're taking on a significant liability and a risk. 
uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if there's just a rough sort of wireframe or something of some functionality that can be interpreted different ways, the client will interpret it to their advantage and potentially you would interpret it to your advantage. So it's in everyone's interest to actually have it well defined. Um, move on. Um, have a look at some model contracts. There's a few examples of some model contracts on the web there. <laughs> yeah, Ryan. Where's, oh, yeah, up the top, yeah, nah, yeah. Uh, I think I was looking at the contract that we actually use and it has a generic scope section, sort of say, this is a web con website development contract, blah, 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 legal stuff. And then in the, um, in the uh, what do you call it, the addendum, the schedule, uh, we actually define in more detail what it is. And that usually refers to an external document, which is like a specification document anyway. Um, and have a look at the resources. There's some, there's some good contracts out there. I suggest you use a contract, very important contract conditions. And that was my coverage of contracts, Ryan, because you put that comment in the, on the page. That's it, no time for anything else. So, um, the verdict for me method number three, hop on the bus, Gus. Um, yeah, can work, okay, but make sure the project is on a good footing, would be my summary. Okay, number four, we're gonna s s really speed up now. <laughs> Uh, okay, this one here. Um. You don't need to be coy, Roy. You just listen to me. Okay, just listen to me. You will do it how I say you will do it. <laughs> um, tenders can be really prescriptive and often you don't get a choice really about how the thing works. Um, for example, oh, the worst kind of prescriptive, I'm sure everyone who's done tenders have actually seen this, the dreaded standardized CMS requirement list. Uh, Drupal actually handles these things fairly well and everything, but man, it takes you a long time to respond. And I, they won't be written for Drupal. Pam uh, Barone is going to have a great session tomorrow called Rethink Your Requirements, and it's all about fashioning your requirements um, around <coughs> Drupal and what it can do. And often it's just a slight change of wording or a, a, a change in slight change of requirement that really doesn't mean anything to the client that will make some, some hard thing simple. Yeah. And you all know that. Uh, so yeah, these requirements, this particular one was yeah, 111 requirements, and that's not as bad as they get. They get significantly worse. Um, and I just think they're really sucky, to be honest, because it's a cop out for the client. They simply don't have to think. Um, it's, it's not related to their real requirements. Why do they want all this stuff? Because they think they might need it or something. Um, as you know, PHP being interpretive, adding lots and lots of extra modules, you know, you wanna, you wanna make sure you, you put them in there for the right reasons, because it's gonna make your site slower, or he more heavy anyway. I know there are ways you can deal with that, but gee, isn't the best way actually not having the problem in the first place? Um, and the suckiest reason, I must say, we won, a, we won a, a tender a few years ago, and the client said to me after, and it had one of these big long lists, and I responded to it, and the client said to me after, Oh, we didn't really mean that. We just got that from, um, we just bought that list of requirements so that we could pre-qualify the vendors, you know, make sure that they knew what they're talking about. Yep. So that's not valuing the vendor's time. Um, okay, so what is a tender? Um, it's a structured invitation to vendors. Usually it's very formal um, and well organized and well intentioned and everything, but can really be off the mark and stuff. But as I said before, if you give them something other than they asked with, they might um, welcome it with open arms, but they might also disqualify you completely, so it's a bit of a, a lucky dip there. Um, as well as being prescriptive, um, there can obviously be a, a significant investment involved. Tenders are usually quite large. <coughs> they only have one winner. Um, we, again, uh, a couple of years ago, um, applied for Work Cover Queensland, a nice high profile sort of site. Um, we and, and uh, there was a second round, so we got in the top three for the first round and then the next round was give us a demo system, <laughs> uh, which is also kind of interesting. And so we gave them what they said was the best demo they had and then they chose someone else, which is kind of interesting. Based for a lot of reasons. Uh, risk assessment as well, look, can be really important for tenders. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to go over this, but if seriously look up ASNZS ISO 31000, Sounds really hard. It's the Australian standard, 
uh, which has been adopted as the international standard now. And it's very clear, um, but you just have to go through certain steps such as have a risk management framework, have a process, uh, and this is really probably the topic for another day, I think. But I've got a few notes in here that you can, that you can look at. The most important thing is the risk register, which is really define all the things that could go wrong, how important, work out how important they are or how severe they're going to be, and tell us how you're going to mitigate those risks. Um, and if you don't do that, and one of your competitors does do that, they will assume the worst of, of um, your, your um, ability to be able to cope with those risks because you haven't addressed them. Um, and tenders are often difficult for small companies, to be honest, uh, because they require so much work and, um, and everything, and they sort of seem to be sort of set up for larger companies, particularly when government departments feel better about larger employing larger organisations to do things. Yes and no, um, but um, that's what I've found certainly a couple of times uh, from experience. Um, these days, Drupal is much bigger. It's much more well accepted in larger organisations. And again, we're going to hear about that um, tomorrow. Um, and of course, there are partnership op opportunities with companies like uh, Acquia and others. Um, how do you cost them? Um, OK, I think you have a detailed list again. You've really got to sort of cost, work out what's going to be in that, in that list and everything. Um, and uh, use a similar sort of spreadsheet to what we had before, but it's going to be much bigger simply because there are so many more things involved. Include your preparation time. They're going to ask at least five, well, at least five probably ten organisations are going to submit. Um, they get the benefit of all that ten, the, the nine that actually miss out, uh, who put in the work and everything, so I reckon they can, they can uh, be charged a bit more. Tenders, uh, tendering organisations also tend to be bigger projects. They are less price sensitive, but particularly these days in state government departments with governments being fairly strapped for cash, they are after overall value for money. So they really want good quality at a reasonable price. Doesn't have to be the lowest price though. Uh, and there's lots of places that you can actually find tenders. There's a few examples there. Um, okay. And that's uh, my verdict on tenders then, uh, is they can be very worthwhile, but think carefully before committing, committing to the substantial work involved, I would say. Um, OK, uh, the ballpark estimate. We did start at quarter two, four, didn't we? OK, is that right? Yeah. Um, Ballpark estimate is um, like gold because um, if you can actually give a quick ballpark estimate to a client, uh, instead of spending copious hours, it saves everyone a lot of time poten potentially. So really my definition of the ballpark estimate is coming up with a number without putting in a heck of a lot of effort. Um, all these situations is when they can be handy and there's lots and lots of situations there um, for when to use a ballpark estimate. Again, it's sort of related to this idea of, you know, feel. You get a feel for the project, a feel for the client um, to work out sort of how much a project's going to cost. And often you can actually give them a ballpark answer that you think is going to be right-ish. Uh, and they'll say, no, that's too much, you know, and that's it. But you haven't spent a lot of time on it, so great. Oh, we didn't have the, um, we didn't have the thingy, did we? <laughs> no one told me. You don't need to discuss much. Yeah, which is really cool. You don't need to discuss much on, on those because you don't need to go into a detailed discovery phase. Um, okay, how to make it. Um, a few ways. You can compare it to what you've done before. You can use your feel again. Um, add up some rough costs. Um, and look at number six. Okay, so verdict. I love the ballpark estimates because I reckon it just weeds things out. Um, okay, this is probably the trickiest one, high-level function point counting. <laughs> My version of this, um, uh, function point counting has been around for a very long time and it's uh, all to do with basically, sorry? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. John? Oh. Just drop off the key leaf. Okay, drop off the key leaf. 
Now, unfortunately here, uh, I shouldn't admit to this, should I? I forget why, this, why I put this line on this one, because I worked this out like last year. Um, so I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the key. Yeah, it's probably because it's the key to doing a quote for a really big, complex project. Um, and I'll just brush over this really quickly. Um, um, so there's four steps, really. You classify high-level website functions, okay? So there are things like uh, we need a business directory, we need an events management system, and we need some other stuff. Okay, you assign, assign each of those terms in Drupal speak, uh, vocabulary terms, a number. So a s small, uh, sorry, I'm actually not reading what I'm doing here. So you've got small, medium, and large, you classify. So your business directory might be a large, so you assign it a nine. And your blog will be a, like a, an easy, a quick, a small, so you'll sign that, say, a one. Um, so the, I won't go to the spreadsheet, but basically uh, here is where we put this together. Maybe I will go to the spreadsheet because it's a bit complex. That's the other thing, is you can't be offline to look at these things, can you? Huh, okay. I'll run through this really quickly. So um, we have a magnitude table, small, medium, large jobs, and these are the, the high-level functions, home page, news, galleries, blogs, competitions. You classify them with a magnitude. How big is that, approximately? Um, from this table here, we work out the number of units of work, uh, and we add them up at the bottom. So total number of units of work are 49. Sorry, I'm going through this really quickly. Uh, so therefore, that translates uh, at, um, what was it, four, three or four hours per unit of work to 147 hours. You add on your uh, project management cost, and I forgot contingency. Oh, there it is. Fantastic. And hey, presto, at the bottom, you get a number. Now, this is kind of like your ballpark estimate for a humongous project where you don't want to just go, you know, what do I think sort of that's going to be from, from a feel. Uh, it, it's it's um, really taking into account what's involved in the project um, and giving it some rough ideas. So have a look at the spreadsheet later on anyway. Uh, it's an interesting sort of technique. I use it every now and then uh, when someone does want a quick, in other words, when they don't want to... Um, uh, take much time, they don't want to sort of pay for any discovery phase or anything, you can give them some sort of ballpark estimate. Any questions on that one? Yeah, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, I'll ask you, yep. I've showed this to the client, yeah, yeah. I, look, I, I like to be pretty open and honest, you know, about how I come up with things, and if also they, they tend to, uh, if you give them the bottom line, you know, the 40 grand, they'll say, oh, what does that involve? You know, what can I cut out? They don't have any inf information. Um, but then you're also giving them a haggling point, so eh, swings and roundabouts. John? Oh, I think you'd have to compress a lot of things into a big, a big heading, really. Yeah, often um, they haven't actually thought that far, you know, about the, the specification, I reckon, for, the, for this one. Yep. No, I don't try to hide it. No, I tell them what my contingency is. Um, as long as they don't say um, when you're actually in the project and you use up some of the contingency, they said, uh, oh, c there's a bit of contingency left. Can we use that for something else, please? <laughs> you make it clear right up front, this contingency is, goes into our calculations. What we're charging you is a fixed price bottom line. That's what's in the contract. Yeah, you've got to be clear. One of my tips before was make sure they understand your contract. Yeah. Okay, moving right along because we have to have some questions and finish. You know why I'm in trouble. Hmm. Ah, we are back. Okay, great. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, 147, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Um, one of the uh, things that I skipped, 
there uh, was, yeah, this one here. So um, I took the, the leap of saying, if we go right up to the top, I'm actually saying, right, a project uh, is actually going to be 40% development and 60% something else. Because we've sort of worked out, well, you know, we've um, uh, got pretty good development uh, capabilities. Um, and we've sort of worked out, right, well, the rest of the phases, according to our methodology, are really going to take about 60% of the project sort of all up and 40. So that's the extrapolation phase, basically, to the rest of the project. You might decide to actually base it on, on something else and extrapolate based on different figures, but that's just an example. I just lost my place here, Ryan, um, with my PowerPoint. Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. So, I mean, obviously, I think the greatest thing to do is actually kind of do the percentage of development and kind of extrapolate the way Bob said. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that's when it becomes probably a bit dicey and yeah, you'll have to make your own decisions about how you'd structure that and whether you show it to the client. Um, okay, I lost my place there, but um, uh, so high level function counting. So the verdict on that one is, is uh, really that, um, that can be really handy for quick um, estimates. Okay, the last couple. Uh, why can't we just sleep on it? No time for music. Um, this is really, uh, <laughs> you want music? Oh, that's a really long one, though. He said, why don't we both just that's sleep on it tonight? Okay, so, sing over it, baby. Uh, low budget but high expectations, be creative. Oh, gee, no one's ever heard that before. <laughs> um, low budget but high expectations. Every client really kind of uh, falls into that category almost in, in some ways. I'd just say be creative, think outside the box. I've got a few ideas for how you do that, but I'm sure you've got lots and lots of other ideas yourself. Um, okay, an existing Drupal system. Um, sometimes we, uh, clients actually come to us. Where the heck's the mouse? There it is. The problem is all inside your head, she said to me. The answer is easy if you take it logically. Um, okay, so they have an existing Drupal system developed by someone else. They want you to take over development and all maintenance of the system. That happens a heck of a lot. Um, I think, and look, the answer is really easy. Um, do an hourly rate on it, because you don't really know where that system came from, um, I think. Um, why um, bad development on it? Um, there are ways to actually analyze sites. You know, there's the Acquia Insight tool, which we haven't used before, but it sounds like it does that sort of thing, and there's some other things. Um, and the, maybe the problem was the actual client was a bad client rather than their developer. That's yeah, and you usually can tell that by the feel when you talk to them. Um, so I reckon uh, start with a small task, bill in advance, blocks of hours, easy. Um, okay, something. Here we are. I wish there was something I could do. Here's a funny one. Quote high if you don't want the job or the client, and you can't tell them directly. Um, you know, and there's lots of reasons why you can't tell them directly. That maybe they're difficult to deal with, and you can never tell a client that, really, because they, they just won't see that. Um, so, quote high, you don't want the work. Um, you don't agree with the project's morals. Uh, gee, I've just got to tell you, I, I hadn't actually worked out. Um, I got a call, call early on after starting Sunning Glow Digital from a brothel. They wanted me to do a brothel website with explicit content. And I said, uh, uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> but then I quickly worked out a policy um, to deal with that. And since I've said that, I have to deal with what the policy was, which was if I don't feel comfortable showing my kids, I'm not going to take it on. Yeah, I've used that a few times. It's great. Um, and maybe you don't want to tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. Um, yep, so, uh, it, and if the match doesn't feel right, or if they smell, maybe you don't want to tell them that. I don't know. Um, and lastly, oh, this is my absolute favourite, and it's a great one to finish on. Okay, tell them you don't want to work with them. 
declined to be involved, uh, and for a number of reasons, you know, that you can tell them, you haven't got enough money, this isn't going to work and everything, you disagree with their morals, you know, and you can tell them, um, and uh, the old famous history of bad debts. Um, so there's a few summary points there, but we're out of time. I wanted to incorporate this in somewhere, but I really couldn't find a spot for it, so I thought I'd just throw it in at the end. <laughs> um, I thought that was excellent. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah. Okay, maybe the moral is read the fine print in your contracts. All right, so we're done. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I haven't left any time for questions and stuff, but I'm glad we had some time in between. Uh, look, I'll take one, just maybe one. Anyone with a question? Otherwise, we'll talk later. Great. Oh, yes, Ryan. Yeah, okay. Uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the ballpark. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And any other situation as well. A range is, is good. Yeah. Look, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, uh, really appreciate your attendance. Hope that was useful. Oh, yes, and you've got a complete feedback as well. Apparently, they want you to complete feedback. There's a feedback form now on the website. Thank you.